have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is week three of the life of David, and I was going to go through a big introduction, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, we've got a, uh, three people that I want you to pray for. I want you to pray for uh, Pastor James Wright. He's the founding pastor of Maranatha. Uh, he was having some chest pains today. They took him to the hospital. They're keeping him overnight. They, uh, all of his enzymes, enzymes have come back uh, good. Uh, but they're keeping him over, and I believe they're going to do a stress test or a heart cath tomorrow. So pray for him. Pray for Bob Freeman, one of our deacons that is still uh, in ICU uh, up in uh, Charleston. Please pray for him. We need Bob to wake up. We need Bob to wake up. So just pray that God would wake up this man of God. Bring him back to us and pray that God uh, and uh, pray for Joe Gunner. Father, we just lift these three men up to you right now, Lord. Father, they are beyond our care. They are beyond what we can do. But Father, they are right in line for a miracle from you. And Lord, I pray that you would touch each one of them. I pray you'd raise them up. I pray you'd heal them completely from top to bottom, inside and out. And Father, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have been battling discouragement, uh, fear, or distraction, I want you to stand up right now. Seriously. Discouragement, fear, distraction, if this is you in any way, shape, or form. And I'm going to, the Lord just dealt with my heart about this right before I got up here. I want you to, I want you to do something. I just want you to, to just, just act like you're grabbing your head and take that mindset off and set it down to your left. Okay? All right. Left, right, people. My wife struggles with that. They're, they're up here on the front row doing this. I know she's the ringleader. I know it. I know it. I know it. Now, I want, you to, I want you to reach over on the other side. <laughs> and I want you to pick up a renewed mind, the mind of Christ, the sound mind. And I want you to replace that old mindset with that right now. And Father, I pray right now that you touch every mind in this house, even those watching by internet, Lord. And Father, I pray that no longer would fear reside, but it would go right now. And fear is trespassing. And, and the child of God, and I command you to go right now, I, I call these minds renewed, I call them sound, I call them whole, I call them well, I call them well right now, and I ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. You may be seated, I'm going to teach you tonight uh, about uh, face your giants, Psalm uh, 17, uh, first, I'm sorry, 1 first Samuel 17, and I was struggling as to whether or not to even go into the, the whole story of David and Goliath as we go through the life of David, but there's just some things in there that I couldn't just pass up. I'm, I'm going to uh, step away from the book, uh, The Tale of Three Kings. It really doesn't talk much about it in there, uh, but I just couldn't pass it up. And I want you to understand, as we go through this chapter, that we are reading about a young man that is between the age of 15 and 16 years old. He's not a man that is up in years and experience and wisdom. He, he is... Remember, remember when you were young enough to just not care a whole lot, but just have a lot of energy and believe that God had something really out there for you? Is anybody? It doesn't matter how old you are. That's still there. Do you know what happens? We lose that childlike faith. We lose it. And Jesus tells us throughout the New Testament to be childlike. So just tell your neighbor, you need to be more childlike. But I want you to understand that what we're going to learn tonight comes from a young man between 15 and 16 years old. Tell your neighbor, face your giants. David was a giant slayer. And he trained others how to slay giants. And I'll go a step further and say he is still training people today how to slay giants. When you have someone like, when you have people around you like this, it, it evokes, it, 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 it awakens, it stirs something on the inside of you. You feel stronger just because you're around people like that. And it didn't matter if it was a lion, if it was a bear, if it was a nine-foot giant or a whole valley of giants. It didn't matter if it was a mad king, an undermining son, or the giant inside of David. He was willing to deal with it. The only difference was the tactics that he used to deal with it. There will always be a giant arise between you and what God has for you to possess. There will always be a giant arise to try to keep you from advancing to be all that God wants you to be. And when that giant shows up in your life, I said when, not if. 
When that giant shows up in your life, it didn't get there by accident. That giant is there by the providence of God. It's because he allowed it. God knows it's there. He allowed it. He sent it. He put it there to build your character. He put it there to build your faith. He put it there to increase your anointing. He put it there to equip you and to advance you, but never to destroy you. But the crazy thing about all of this is is the fact that when a giant shows up, the choice is not God's as to what it produces. The choice is ours as to what it produces. I told you last week, God is not afraid to take a risk with you. Some of you didn't like that too much. But God loves you enough to give you a choice to choose what is right and what's evil. And every time a giant shows up in our life, we are the one to choose what it produces in our life. That's just a good word. In 1 Samuel 17, Israel has a problem. His name was Goliath. How big was the problem? 1 Samuel 17, 3 through 7. I'm going to read New Living Translation in this just because it gives specific weights. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on the opposite hill. And I have a water, please. With the valley between them. Then Goliath... A Philistine champion from Gath, thank you very much, came out to the Philistine rank, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. That's more than so what some of you women weigh. Coat of mail. Don't, don't go too far in that, don't put me in trouble. Weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as as a weaver's beam. Tipped in an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. If Goliath was that big, how big was his armor bearer carrying a shield is what I want to know. The problem, but listen, the problem produced a problem. The problem that was produced by the problem was fear. As giants often do, it inflicts, it evokes fear. But I come to remind you tonight that you are already more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. It's not a matter of if it arises. God has already placed that conquer, that, that conquerability, if you, will, if you will, on the inside of you. It's already there. Because you are a child of God, it's instantly a part of your DNA. So you're already more than a conqueror. Then verses 8 through 11. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be servants to us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul, tell your neighbor, he's talking about the king right there. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. King Saul was struck with fear. This is the main problem. Because when the king, when the leader is struck with fear, everyone deals with fear. Because if the anointing flows from the head down, so does everything else. But notice in that scripture, it said that Saul and all of Israel, all of Israel was not there. Just the army of Israel. But since the king was struck with fear, all of Israel, you with me? was struck with fear. You have to understand, men, as the head of your home, there's times you have to stand. And what time you are afraid, you will trust in God. There is something to be said about a leader 
That they cannot give in to fear. They cannot give in to, to, to living an impure lifestyle. Because if you do, everyone around you will. It's a good word. There, there are times in our lives that it seems like when everyone who is supposed to be standing true and tall is turning, failing, and becoming to become under pressure of fear. Sometimes it's just like things happen. And you, the people that you look to, they're turning. And now they're running. But there must be something on the inside. That's where you come in, David. Other people can run, but you cannot. Because God placed something on the inside of you to stand. God placed something on the inside of you to stand up and fight and say, No, Goliath, you will not have this land. That's where you come in. Tell your neighbor, that's where you come in. The nation of Israel was in trouble. Fear had consumed it, but God always provided. It doesn't matter how dark it gets. It doesn't matter how lonely it gets. God always has a plan. Yes, God always has a plan. I don't care where it's at or what it is. God always has a plan. I want to give you principles to victory tonight or principles to defeating your giants. I had seven of them, but I'll reduce it down to five. Number one. Principle number one to victory. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Tell your neighbor, stay faithful. Verses 14 through 18, David was the youngest and the three oldest followed Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse was in the army with Saul, but Jesse was the youngest. Verse 15, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now to your brothers an ephah of dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses. If it was me, the cheese would have never made it. <laughs> and carry these ten cheeses to the, to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. God cannot and will not advance you until you have been faithful with what he first gave you to do. That is an important message right there that you need to write down. God cannot nor will he advance you until you have been faithful with your first assignment. Many times people, they'll get in their first assignment, they'll get bored with that, and they'll want to move on, but God said, no, you haven't completed this task yet. And if you move on from that one, you will not finish anything else because you never finished the first one. What are you talking about? I'm talking about verse 15. Notice how David was in the palace playing music for Saul. But then 15 said, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. What was David's first calling? Shepherd. It wasn't heart player to the king. It was heart player to the sheep. It was caring and loving the sheep that God entrusted him. You may sense the transition is upon you, but you must remain faithful until that transition comes to pass by God. I, I, I could keep on going right there, but I, I, I've got place, other places I've got to visit tonight. In other words, you must finish what God gave you first. David knew that he was anointed to be king, but he never lost shot, sight of being the shepherd to the sheep. He had kingship all over him. It's what he was born for. But he still remembered he never lost sight of shepherding sheep. He always made sure that what God entrusted with him first was taken care of. If one cannot be trusted with little or few, how can God be, how can you be trusted or faithful with much? Everybody wants more of God. How can God give us more until we're faithful with the little that he's given us first? If you listen, if you want to destroy someone with a vision or a calling or, or, or a direction, give them something else to look at. Give them something else that'll catch their eye or, or captivate their attention. Give them something big to look at. Give them something shiny to look at. Or give them something that will inflict enough fear in them that'll cause them to quit. That's what happened to the army of Israel. 
is that it wasn't shiny, but it was big and it inflicted enough fear in them it caused them to quit. But David said, no, I've just begun. And he was faithful with what God gave him first. But then look at verse 16. I love this. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Now, this is in the middle. This, this makes no sense why, why verse 16 would be where it is. We're talking about in verse 15 how David goes back to the farm to take care of the sheep. And in 17 and 18, his dad's telling him, take the, the bread and the grain and the cheeses to your sons and their captains. But look at verse 16, right in the middle of that. And the Philistines drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Remember how I told you that if you want to stop someone, distract someone, or, or ruin a vision that God gave them, give them something to look at? That's what was going on. Because notice how the Philistines said he presented himself 40 days, morning and night. They looked at it for 40 days and 40 nights. Not only did they look about it, they talked about it. How do you know they were church people? Church people are famous for looking and talking but doing nothing. The longer you look, the longer you think about something, the longer you worry about it, the bigger it gets in your mind, the worse it gets in your mind, and eventually you'll talk yourself out of the very thing that God created you for. You think about it in your own life. Problems that, are, that have arisen. And what would you do? You put that old mindset back on. You started worrying about it. You started getting in fear about it. And you made it bigger and bigger. What about that renewed mind? What about the salvation of God? What about the faithfulness of God? What about the might of God that can look upon a situation and change it? What about that God? But we're so quickly consumed by negativity and fear, consumed with all this stuff. Stay faithful, children of God. Keep your trust in Almighty God and watch Him move in your life. Yeah. Point number two see things through the eyes of God, or see things through the eyes of victory. Verse 26 Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach? See, we want, we want to make David into be this little googly-eyed, fluffy, nice, sweet kid. David would kill you in a heartbeat. Don't try to put him in that kind of mold. He was a man after God's own heart, but man, he was vicious. He was a warrior. And he shows, he shows up, he said, what do I get when I kill him? Bottom line, that's what David wanted to know. What do I... What, what do I get when I kill him? Notice the word if was never in the question. It was never, what do I get if I kill him? What do I get? What does the man get that, that, that kills him? And they said, well, you get a tax-free life and you get to marry the king's daughter. And if he was smart, he'd forgot about the king's daughter just taking a tax-free life and everything good. I'm going to say something to you right now, and I want you to get a hold of it, and I don't ever want you, I, and I don't want you to go back on what I'm about to tell you. The giant you're facing is already defeated. It just doesn't know it yet. Goliath was defeated before he ever defied the armies of God. He just didn't know it yet. If you, go, if you go out in the woods, uh, over here in the swamp, which I don't advise it, but if you would, and you go out there and you would cut a limb off of a tree, that limb would still be green, would it not? Yeah. Still look like it's alive, would it not? Yeah. But it's dead. Why? Because it's separated from the source. Yeah. Yeah. It's already dead, it just doesn't know it yet. Yeah. You. Your enemies are already defeated. Right. They just don't realize it yet. Yeah. But they will die when you realize it. You will see the effect of death on them when you realize they're already defeated. That is a good word. It's from God. Learn to see, learn to pray, learn to war from a place of victory. Not a place of discouragement or defeat. Stop praying from a place of discouragement and defeat. And start praying from a place of victory. The victory is mine. It's already won. And let me tell you something. The victory is not after the battle. Victory is during the battle. 
Learn to fight because victory is already yours. Fight from a place of victory, not getting to victory. Ah, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We're already conquerors. We're already, we've already won. Okay, we walk through some stuff. Okay. Okay, we face some giants. They're already dead. They just don't know it yet. Are you hearing me tonight? This will help you in what you're facing right now. Everyone that stood up said they were discouraged or straight. This will help you if you'll just learn to pray from a place of victory, not discouragement or defeat. Success is inevitable as long as God is in it. Success is guaranteed as long as you keep God in it. Keep God in it. Amen. How do you do that? Realize it isn't your battle. It's the Lord's battle. Yeah. Principle number three. Accept that God wants to use you. Me? Yes. yes. You. Accept that God wants to use you. He has chosen you. He's given you his authority. He wants to use you to set captives free. In verses 32 through 37, Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go fight this Philistine. Now, I remind you, he's 15 or 16 years old. You are having trouble giving the keys to your 15 or 16-year-old son to your car. You're questionable whether you should even give him a key to your house or not. And I won't get into the reasons why, but I know why. And David's going out to fight, face a giant to run the risk of being killed. Although David isn't going to be killed because he's God's elect. But who knew that at the time? Only one. God. So a 15 to 16 year old son says, let no man's heart fail. Looks cocky, really. Let no, man's, let no man's heart fail. I'm here, Jay. All your concerns are over. Goliath is nothing but a little gnat under my foot. It's okay. I'm here. That's virtually what he told the king. But he did do it in such a way, he could have done it in such a way to where he really could have offended the king. But he worded it in such a way, he said, let no man's. He could have said, oh, king, don't let your heart fail. I'm here. I'm going to take care of what you're not willing to face yourself. <laughs> Remember, the king and all of Israel are in fear. Yeah. David shows up, let no man's heart fail. I'm going to take care of it. I'm five foot two. <laughs> red cheeks, red hair, good looking. I won't kill that nine foot giant out there. He wasn't six foot, Frank. You, do you know that? Do you? It's my sermon. It's my sermon, Frank, and I will preach this sermon the way I want to. Okay, he was five foot two and a half. How's that sit down, Frank? Debbie, get him under control. No wonder you're sitting so far away from him. Okay, David, okay, okay, it makes all the difference. David was six foot tall, okay. red cheeks, red hair, good looking. Sit down, Frank. <laughs> yeah, he's still three foot shorter than Goliath. No, he was not. <laughs> Lesson one of sermon prep, do not include people inside the service on what you're preaching. Just preach your message. <laughs> he was over nine foot tall. Now he's ten foot. And, uh, bottom line, stop! <laughs> bottom line, to let no man's heart fail. I'm going to take care of it. Don't need to worry about it. I'm going to take care of it. And what in the world did he base that on? He based it on past experience yeah. with God. Yeah. 
He based it on the faithfulness that he had with God. Saul looked at him and said, don't be crazy. You're but a youth. And this guy, he's been, he, he, he's been a man of war since his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard. I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be one of them. Doesn't matter how big, doesn't matter how tall, doesn't matter his prote protection. I'm going to pull him down because he's exalting himself above God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. <laughs> oh, I got to, I got to move. The nation was in a state of heart failure. The nation was in a state of heart failure. The Greek language in this, if you, if, if, if you were to study it out in the Greek, you'll find that the Greek language is very strong. Israel had already accepted their defeat. They had already accepted the fact they were finished. The heart of Israel was struck with fear. But God sent you. God sent you. God sent you, David, that has no fear that is unconquerable in the, in the eyes of God. God sent you to deliver the nation. He sent David to deliver the nation. And that's why you work where you do. Hear me. This is why you minister where you do. Because it's what's in you that will make the difference and where you are. And I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be obedient tonight. There's some of you that you're facing some hard situations on the job. And you're thinking about checking out. But God says, I've placed you where I've wanted you, David. I've put you there to make a difference in the company. We want security all around us. We always want an avenue to get out. And sometimes you have to learn to face your giant. And sometimes it'll be on the job. Sometimes it'll be a boss. Sometimes it'll be a co-worker. Sometimes it'll be someone in your house. This is good teaching. David said, I'll go fight this Philistine. The word fight in the Greek means to fight, do battle, or to eat or use as food. That doesn't make sense, but it's, it's, it's in the Greek. The word fight means to fight, do battle. Of course, have you ever seen a teenage boy eat? I mean, it's kind of one and the same, right? Yeah. 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 Fight, do battle, eat, or use as food. And I pondered that a little bit. And what that word means, what God's trying to tell us, is that when you face a giant, stop allowing it to frighten you and start allowing it to feed you. Learn to feed the, off the stuff that's coming at you. Because remember, we war from a place of victory. We've already won. We need nour nourishment in there. And God will not allow us to, to, to be faced more than what he has already strengthened us to overcome. Amen? So everything that comes at us, he, it's just food for me. God knows I can handle it, so I'm just going to keep on fighting. I'm going to keep on doing this war. And I know sometimes it gets heavy. Sometimes it's like it's more than you can bear. But God is underneath you. He is lifting you up. He's already strengthened you, and he's already given you everything you need to face and conquer this journey. Giant, somebody praise the Lord this evening. Oh, I, I wanted to go on, but I got to hit this one. Notice, notice in that scripture how David said that when a lion or a bear would steal one of my sheep, 
He said, I would grab it by the beard and I'd remove that lamb from its mouth. And if it turned on me, I'd pull it down and club it to death. I'd kill it. Let me tell you something. You have been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this to remove some sheep from the mouth of the enemy. That's why you are where you are. That's why you work where you work. Stop complaining about it. Be faithful in it. And make a difference where you are. Give God praise right now. Number four. You be you. 38 through 41. So Saul clothed David in his armor. And he put a bronze helmet on his head. And he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk. For he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk in these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began to draw near to David, and the man who bore his shield went before him. Listen, stop trying to be someone else. Just be you. Just be you. Just be yourself. And use what God has given to you. Stop trying to obtain things that God has not given to you. Stop trying to be, stop trying to walk in someone else's shadow. And just be satisfied with the shadow of the Almighty. Stop trying to be someone else. Just be you. Stop comparing yourself to other people. Oh, I could, I could. Stop gauging your success based on what others say about you. And just keep yourself in the hand of God. Use your own stuff. You use your song. You use your prayer. You use your witness. You use your dance. You use your warfare. You use your heart. You use your anointing. You preach your message. You just be you. Stop trying to be someone else and just be you. <laughs> pretty good family, you know, when we're all just us, we make a pretty good family, when we're not trying to be like someone else, not jump like someone else, not shout like someone else, not cry like someone else, but just be you, I got messed up Sunday morning. I mean, I mean messed up because, because I saw some people do some things up on this platform that I wasn't used to seeing certain people do. But when they stepped out and they were just them and it messed me, it did something inside of me that hadn't been there in a long time. Just be you. Use your stuff. No one can use it like you use it. No one can use your warfare the way you can. Dan, Daniel all the time up, up here, he, he, he's up here, man, Daniel's just Daniel. One of these days I'm going to see him in a suit, but I don't know when it is. But, but he, 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 he's just Daniel. And, 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 and he, he, he told me one time, he said, if I ever get too weird... If I ever get too weird, just tell me. Sometimes it's what he calls weird feeds me. 
Brother, don't you ever be anybody but you. Don't you let anybody take you out of the mold that God created you to be. People say to me, how come, how come you don't wear blue jeans? I don't want to wear blue jeans up here. If I wanted to wear blue jeans, I'd wear blue jeans. <laughs> Leave me alone with blue jeans. If you want to wear them, wear them. I've got dress blue jeans. I can look good in dress blue jeans, but I don't want to wear dress blue jeans. I don't want to wear blue jeans on a platform. I wear what I want to wear because I'm me. You be you. You cry like you cry, and I'll ugly cry like I cry, and we'll both be happy. Can somebody say amen? amen. I'll never forget the day I shattered one girl, one little girl's dream. It was when we were doing the passion play, and I come in. It, it, it was in the evening, and I walked through room six, and I had on blue jeans. And this one little girl looked at her mommy and said, Mommy, pastor's got on blue jeans. She said, Haven't you ever seen a pastor in blue jeans before? No. I shattered her whole world. I think it's been the last time. Anyway, just be you. Just be you. Point number five. Principle number five is the battle is the Lord's. 42 through 47. And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdained him, and he was young, or he was only a youth. Ruddy and good looking. Five foot two. Right right there. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just te I'm teasing, Fry. I'm teasing. Stay in your I'm teasing, teasing. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Sometimes that giant you face will even make fun of how you operate and what you operate with. That's the best you got. Is that the best song you know? Yep. That's it. But it worked for the lion. And it's brought down the bear. And you're next. It may not be pretty. It may not be refined. It might not look good. But it's mine. I got it out on the hillside. Taking care of sheep that no one else wanted to take care of. Yes, it's mine. And I'm going to use it. What am I, a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defiled. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. I mean, David, man, this, this five foot two to six foot tall individual here, he's making some pretty big statements. He said, not only am I going to take you down, I'm going to lift your head from your body. And this day I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. The heart of Israel may be failing right now, but as soon as I lift your head from your body, they're going to be quickened and brought back to life, and everyone will know there is a God still in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David did not rely upon himself. He was dependent on the Lord. 
David wasn't cocky. He was confident in Christ. Remember last week I told you that discouragement will erode your confidence? That's why our mind must be stayed on the Lord. Remember past victories. Remember how God's moved. Why? Because it quickens, it brings something alive on the inside of you today. Last night, I'm just going to be real. Yesterday, I was sick all day yesterday. I had meetings all day yesterday, and I was sick through the meetings, and and I went home, and all I wanted to do was get on my couch, and I laid on that couch almost all evening. And I, I don't know if it was a stomach flu or what I had, but, man, I was just sick. And my wife said, this is all over Instagram or Facebook. or something. I don't know which one it was, but it was that clip of Sunday morning. What was it? Was it Facebook? Facebook, on, on Facebook. She said, everybody's sharing this. And I said, let me see it. And it was that song. It was that song where everybody just was themselves, man. Yeah, yeah. I said, oh, this is when so-and-so, when they did, oh, this way, there, right there, right there. That's what I was talking, right there. That's what I was talking about, honey. I, I don't know, but there was a victory. There, there was a time in that song, in a 1045 service, it was phenomenal in the nine, and very seldom do, do things uh, uh, reproduce uh, in, in both services the, 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 in the same way. Yeah. You all stand your feet and get ready because we're going to have to close, and as soon as we close, you've got to get your kids. <clears throat> and, and, and God moved in a great way in the 9 a.m. service. Then we got into 1045 service, and there was a time in that service where there was just a flood of the Holy Ghost just whew. I mean I, I felt it I, I literally felt that in my body and that's when I saw people just be themselves and even though I was sick yesterday it stirred it, it, it did something inside of me I was lifted and encouraged because I reviewed a past move of God does that make sense to you? The enemy is trying to smother you with discouragement. Hear me. The enemy is trying to smother you with discouragement. And the reason being is because he's afraid of what God has placed in you. Anytime, anytime you are being battled, anytime the enemy is trying to discourage you and take you out, if you feel like that the enemy is just trying to destroy you, it's because God has... Has, has sown a seed on the inside of you. The enemy is trying to destroy it before you can give birth to it. That's why he's trying to smother you with discouragement. Because if he can put enough discouragement in front of you, he can defeat what God's placed in you. And let me tell you something. If you're not willing to stand in what God's called you to right now, Somewhere else, somewhere down the line, someone will. And this is, let, let me just close with this. The giants that you won't face today will be the giants the next generation will have to deal with. And I don't want the next generation dealing with, I can cry and whine all I want. Say, oh God. Sometimes you just feel like alfalfa. I won't even go there. <laughs> oh God, don't you love me anymore? This is terrible. I can't believe all this coming to me at one time. You can look at it like that, be discouraged and get smothered if you want to. Or you can take the challenge, David, you can stand up and say, not on my watch. Lion, bear, giant, it doesn't matter. I'll pull you down so the next generation will not have to deal with you. Now, 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 let me just say this real quick. David, all his life, he fought. But his, his next generation was Solomon. How much did Solomon 
have to fight. There was a time in Solomon's reign where it said everything around me on all sides is at peace and rest. I believe if you will just stand and fight the giant that's in front of you, I believe there will be a time in your life where the next generation will be able to look at it and say, look at this. On all sides, there is a place of peace and rest. If you're in a battle, come. If you're facing a giant, come. If you need God to transform your life, renew your mind, you come now as Joey sings. He whispers in my ear, tells me that I'm fearless. Mm. He shares a melody. Tells me to repeat it. If you just need help, come tonight. He makes me whole. He reminds my soul. I am all. Sing that with her if you would. He says I am. I am all. Sometimes you just have to call yourself a victor. Sometimes you got to call yourself a champion. You're God's man. You're God's woman. He says I am. And he, he says, says I am his own. If anybody's willing to come and just give him thanks tonight around this altar for past victories. Sing that again, Beth. I am all he says I am. I am all he's been faithful to you. He says I am. He's led you to victory. I am all he's delivered your son or daughter, husband or wife. here if you would just just lift your hands and let's just sing that one more time Beth and we'll, we'll close I am yeah. he says I am I am all. he says I am I am all. he says Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that we would stop allowing Goliaths to keep us from serving you. I pray that we would stop allowing giants to delay our progress, that we'd stop allowing giants to discourage us from receiving all that God has for us. The Lord, no longer would we get discouraged when we face a giant. But we'll be faithful, whether small or great, that we'll remember whose hand we're in. And it doesn't matter if it's a lion, a bear, an accusation, a Facebook post, a comment, or a nine-foot giant. That God will remember in you were more than victors. In you were already more than conquerors, God. The enemy's already defeated. The giant's already defeated. He may not know it yet, but he's already coming down. So, Father, right now, tonight, we just place ourselves in your hand. And Father, I pray if there's anyone in this house who doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that tonight they would make a decision that their lives would be completely transformed. That tonight they would come to you and they would just simply say, Jesus, 
Forgive me of my sins, God. Forgive me. And tonight, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. Tonight, God, come into my heart. Wash me with your blood. Wash away my past. Wash away all my stains. Wash away all my sins. And tonight, Jesus, make me new. Make my heart your home. Save me, Jesus, I pray. And I thank you for it. And I ask it in Jesus' name. If you accepted the Lord tonight, tell someone in this house before you leave. We just want to get you some information. But Father, tonight, if there's any discouraged in the house, may they just simply pray this prayer. Jesus, I come to you tonight from a different position. Tonight I come from a position of victory and not defeat. Tonight I come from a position of an overcomer, not of discouragement. And Jesus, I'm in you. And you've already caused me to be more than a conqueror. So, Father, I pray you'd go before me. I pray you'd come behind me. I pray that you'd straighten things out and you'd make the way straight and clear. Lord, help me to keep my mind on you. Help my mind to continue to be renewed and transformed, God. May I never let my mind wander again, God. May I keep my mind in worship. May I keep my mind in prayer. May I keep my mind in the Scripture. Father, lead me now in the way everlasting. Jesus, for all my life, I will give you glory, honor, and praise, for you are the king of my soul. I thank you for it, and I ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for coming tonight.